So in this video, we'll be covering all about the X-Pro Templar 250 Dual Sport Motorcycle. It's a little dual sport sold on Amazon and various other sites. I couldn't find many videos covering much about it on YouTube, so I decided to put my hard-earned money out on it, try it out, see if it's good or bad, and share my results, what I find with you guys on the internet. We'll be going over ordering, a bit about assembly and some tips on that, and taking out for a trail ride, and my overall initial feelings on the bike. And the future videos will be covering some modifications and make it a little more powerful and some more things better for the trail. And we'll be taking out and riding it pretty hard in some of the trails. So stay tuned for those videos as well. All right, the box is in good shape. Got the color I wanted, red. Here's the model. They're claiming 242 pounds. Now I hope this number's wrong. I heard somebody say that it was like 236, but we'll see. Yep, of course. We mentioned that in a previous video on the other bike. All right, let's get open in this thing. Box is actually in really good shape. No major damage. Let's get building this thing. One thing that struck me as being right off the bat was the rims. The front rim looks pretty good. I mean, we'll see if it's true or not. But uh, again, they didn't get the seal in here very well. I got to tap that in. The hubs look really well machined. Super, super fat spokes on here. I mean, kind of heavy front wheel. Not terrible, but... uh. Those spokes are massive. So I ordered this bike through powersportsmax.com. Uh, they seem to have the best price I could find on it, and they seem all right to deal with. You can also get these bikes on Amazon. There will be links below to all those, so you can check out all the different models they sell. There's actually three different Templars. The pallet was pretty busted up under this thing. The package was in fine shape. But this guy is pretty buckled in right here. You can see this crate got dropped at some point. These are all bowed in, buckled, buckled. So this thing got dropped pretty hard. So we'll kind of look it over. The bike looks like it's in fine shape. Came with some uh, nice little, little straps here. So we're gonna get this thing unbuckled here. So here, the bike just kind of comes to you crated up. I kind of like that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's pretty simple to put together. Some handlebars, some plastics, front wheel, some stuff like that. And it doesn't take much to set up. If you've done any motorcycle maintenance, it shouldn't be very hard for you to do something like this. Plus, it gets you to understand the bike and the components a little bit better. Right here, I'm just using blue Loctite on everything I put on. I've even thrown over some of the other hardware, removed it later. I put blue Loctite on everything so you're not losing anything on the trail. Pretty simple, just putting on some handlebar clamps here. Came with some uh, the aluminum fatty bars on the bike. Well, all the quality of the components overall is pretty decent. A lot of the hardware that comes on the bike is stainless steel. Pretty simple. Now, keep in mind, most motorcycle shops take the bikes out of the crate like Hondas and Yamahas, and they charge a premium to do this kind of work. You're paying usually an extra three to $600 to get a mechanic to put together a bike like this. And if you ride motorbikes, you should have some basic mechanical skills and understand that because motorcycles take a lot more maintenance than a car does. So just kind of clean it up here, clean up the rotors and uh, pads just because in case there's any shipping grease on anything, packing grease, I just want to make sure that uh, the brakes are all cleaned up with brake clean. Right here, I'm kind of lubing up the uh, axle, put it in there so it doesn't get seized later on. Put a little grease on the axle, on the bushings, on the seals. Here again, I'm cleaning up the pads a little brake clean. And the pads, once they get scrubbed in for broken in, they work pretty well. These brakes are pretty decent on this bike. So after I got that caliper mounted, now I'm kind of working on this little speed sensor that runs off of some little magnets on the inside of the rotor. Just want to make sure that's set up right. Here, I found that a lot of the components like these uh, fork leg protectors right here, I just backed all the stainless hardware out and just put a little drop of blue Loctite on each piece of hardware just because I don't want it rattling out later and falling off on the trail. It's a new bike and uh, might as well make sure everything's secured nice. And, uh, you know, there's only so much components you really have to tighten on yourself. So that's why I'm taking even extra hardware out and just double checking it's torqued right mm -hmm. and uh, has some blue Loctite on it. This fender right here, I was kind of laughing when I got it. This is a full-on KTM style front fender. It's got that built-in fender brace. I had a 2014 EXCW, and uh, it has the exact same looking fender, just in orange. I'm sure the KTM plastic's a little bit better quality overall than the Chinese plastic, but you know what? At least you can find a simple replacement fender for almost any KTM that era. Right here, I'm just kind of bolting on the little digital dash on this thing. I did find that I had a hard time getting the wiring loom, everything tucked away behind the uh, headlight. I'll go over that a little bit later. Now I'm using some ratchet straps to raise the back end of the bike up so I can hook up some of the linkage. Again, I pulled all this hardware out and lubed up all the little bushing points in it and then put the hardware back end 
and put a little blue Loctite on each uh, bolt just to make sure you didn't want anything like this coming off later and torqued them down. Uh, pretty simple to put this together. When I bought this bike, I was a little worried about being too tall for me because it was really hard to tell how big they were online. No one really talked about the height. We'll go over that later in the video, what weight rating I think the suspension set up for and height wise that you could get by with riding this bike. So about ready to lower the bike down here. We're going to mount on the uh, kind of tank plastic that kind of goes up. It could, they look like radiator guards, but of course it's an air-cooled bike. They must be air scoops. And it's got the same style center bolt under the seat, just like a KTM would. So we're going to pull off the seat next here. It's also got a really big kind of side-mounted air filter on here. It looks just like the 2014 KTM I had. So I think air filter is going to be easy to get to. Uh, so mounting the little stainless steel hardware into these. These were a little, had to be flexed into place a little bit, the plastics, because they've never been down to the bike yet. Uh, I've looked over my XCW plastics, and they looked like you could bolt them on here. The two main bolts going under the seat on the tank look like you might have to redrill one of them, but the plastics were almost identical. Now I'm going to work on the headlight here and try to get all these lights hooked up. Of course, you got to put the turn signals into the headlight housing and... Um, mount all those up just make sure you get your uh, blue wire to blue wire green wire to green wire and so on and it's pretty self-explanatory in here about half the wiring looms underneath the headlight shell here are rubber sealed and half of them aren't so it's kind of interesting i'm not sure why they did only half of them but actually took a little bit to try to get all these looms pushed into this little rubber seal thing it's just a little cover that covers and gets or cuts down a rain getting in there it took me a while to readjust this and when you do get your headlight loom set up on there make sure when you turn the handlebars back and forth you're not pulling on the main wiring loom so another little tip when you actually get into here to wire up your front turn signals just double check on your rear turn signals under the back fender which is right and left for the wiring colors there should be a green and orange and a blue and a green just make sure you got your right and right and left to left here I'm just setting up this nice little shifter, blue Loctite net, getting it set up how I want, putting on the rear turn signals. Um, next, I'm going to jump over and measure the ID of the exhaust because I actually I'm going to order a spark arrestor. We'll go over that a little bit later. So when you do take this plug out, there's Allen in here, and there's a great chance it's going to fall down the muffler. you got to wiggle it out. So the opening of this is 32 millimeter inside, so I'm going to try to order one of those spark arresters like I saw on the other YouTube channel, which I'll recommend in a moment. Nice little TIG welds on here. It's all stainless. I mean, we'll see if they crack, but their welds actually look better than if I did them myself. These ones are a little undercut, though, so I could see something like that cracking off. But uh, I hear that these rubber bumpers melt off of here, and that starts melting your side panel. So we'll probably get something better, some make some aluminum standoffs or something. Yeah, the muffler is actually way nicer quality. The whole header pipe and everything is way nicer than I expected they would put on the bike. And underneath that side panel is actually uh, kind of foil-wrapped um, insulation to keep the side panel from burning up. So now the air filter setup comes across a big plate back here in the air box, very similar to my KTM, but I do see that it has not been oiled. So we'll pull that thing out in a day or two and oil it before we ride it much. It's middle of winter, so we're, we're not really dealing with much dust here. Going to hook up the battery now, pull out the oil, the shipping oil in the engine, drain that out and put a fresh cord in there and try to fire this thing up. So in the next video, we're going to be going over a bunch of upgrades. Some cost some money, some are free. But one of the things we're going to be doing is replacing this battery on this bike with a really high-end battery that's actually under a pound. So we're going to save two and a half to three pounds just by changing out the batteries. I hear the chains and batteries on these bikes are pretty cheap. They're well worth replacing for more reliability. Right here, we're going over and just pulling out the hardware for the clutch here and just to put a little grease on it and uh, to the pivot point, just grease it up and put a little cable lube down the clutch cable and the choke cable. Once you go over these things and fine tune them and adjust the clutch right and adjust your uh, throttle so it doesn't have a bunch of slop in it and adjust the cable on there, just fine tune your lever placement and just get the bike kind of feeling comfortable for you and your riding position it makes a big difference um, some of these things like again if you have someone else setting up they're not going to set your bike up the way it feels comfortable to you so i don't mind just taking a little extra time and kind of dialing in the angles to everything like this so when i'm riding the levers are a comfortable position pretty simple pretty basic but it just makes the bike feel just tailored for you 
So here I'm getting ready to drain the shipping oil. I think it's mainly in there to keep it splashing around the motors to kind of cut down corrosion and also keep the motorcycle wet clutch hydrated, you know, with the oil on it. But right here, there's a little screen that comes in here. It's a little bit of a filter screen. This isn't the main drain. There's another one on the bottom, like a traditional motorcycle. And I think on the other side of the side, under the side case on the clutch side, these also have a centrifugal oil filter like old Hondas would have. They actually work pretty well. Um, right now I'm draining the oil. But another interesting thing about that larger plug on the side, after digging around, I found an oil cooler for one of these things and contemplating it for a while. I ordered it and will maybe include it in the next video for the upgrades. The reason is these bikes only hold about a quart of oil, so you should really do frequent oil changes. And having a little more capacity and keeping your oil cooler is not a bad thing ever on an air-cooled bike. So we might go over that in a future video. So it came with about 22 PSI in the tires. I brought them down to about 18 for now. Chain seemed a little, well that's really tight. That's crazy. It definitely went right like that. That's gnarly. That's like, no wonder people complain these chains break. That is way too tight. So we gotta back that chain off a little bit. <laughs> See if this thing powers up, see if all the lights work. Okay, it's in kilometers. I think we go to, now we hold down odometer, and then we switch over to miles there. So you can only switch to miles or kilometers when you're in the odometer mode. If you're in the tripometer mode, you cannot do that, so. Okay, that's, uh, headlight works. There's low beam, there's high beam, the indicator works, so that's good. Confirm the turn signals work, turn signals work. Running lights on. Check the back brake, works. Front brake, works. Good. Turn on the gas. So there's a few things on these bikes, same as that uh, 150 Storm I got. And this one's the same, unfortunately. They only have an on and off, maybe like an old motocross bikes had, I believe. But um, kind of sucks because having a little dual sport, you really want to reserve. So having a reserve is always nice, man. It's got me out of a few, few binds on some big dual sport trips before. And X-Pro, if you're listening, Please put reserves on most of your bikes. I can see a pit bike or a little kid bike, not a big thing. But if you're going to make anything with turn signals on it, put a reserve on. There's a few other little things I noticed on here, but we'll get to those later. You know, let's get the bike run and see how that works. So it's got this little, looks like a hot start kind of a trigger or something above the clutch here. This is the choke. Let's see the pull on the choke and crank it over, see what we get. Oh, nothing. I got pull in. Pull this in, then pull the front brake on, that's right. Or put the back brake on. Yeah, that fired right up. Turn off the choke now, see if it'll run. Turn up the idle a little bit. Idle sounds really low. Let's see how that goes. That's a little better. All right, so I got the Templar all put together last night, rode around in the mucky yard and up around some trails around my place for about 10 minutes. Ran pretty good. I'm gonna probably check the valves before I ride it much. Turn up the idle. It seemed to run a lot better just because it just kept stalling out when I first got it going. Right now I'm going to load it up in my little mini truck, take it to town, take it to the motorcycle shop, have them inspect it, and hopefully go get a plate after this. All right, took it to the motorcycle shop. At least in Washington, it costs you about 50 bucks at a shop. It takes about 45 minutes. They'll write out some paperwork for you. The bike has everything besides the certificate origin saying motorcycle. The certificate origin says off-road motorcycle. So it has everything out of the box, including this rear reflector, all the lights, everything to get a plate in Washington. I think probably because it has a plastic tank without a perimeter frame is it's not certified on roads until you go get your $50 certificate from a motorcycle shop. It might vary 50 to 100 depending on the shop's rate. Got a plate, got it registered. So I'm gonna put this on. I'm gonna go take it for a real quick rip. Uh, breaking in the engine that's only got like probably one to two miles on it from right around here. So I'm put the plate on it. We'll ride it and uh, we'll cover a lot more points before the video is up about this bike. The things I like, the things I don't like so much. And of course the next video will be a bunch of updates we plan to do with the bike. We'll talk about gearing, talk about max speed. Uh, we'll take on some trails and rip the hell out of it in the next video. 
you know, see how it's going to hold up. So both this bike and my X-Pro have really nice instrumentation. I'm really happy with this. So I would say almost about as nice as the Grom, maybe nicer. So what it's got is it's got a tack up above. Miles per hour, you can toggle that between miles per hour and kilometers. It's got an overall odometer, plus you got a tripometer if you toggle this. It's got a voltmeter, which is pretty neat. It's got a neutral light, high beam light, turn signal indicator. Right up here, it also tells you what gear you're in once you just shift into first or any of the other gears. So it'll tell you if you're first, second, third, fourth, or fifth right up on this display. This has a funky little choke. It's this little pull choke here. Doesn't have a detent. I wish they would have just pulled a, put a little pull choke up here and just put one on the side of the carb like typical bikes because it's cold blooded in nature because they jet it kind of lean. So it's kind of a da dance between not full, just partially, and you got to sit here while it's warming up with the finger partially holding this. I don't like that very much. I almost want to make this so it's kind of got a jam nut on it so I can set it to where I want and then manually push it forward. Uh, cold blooded, we'll fire this up. Definitely gotta get re -jetted. It's a little cold blooded. So I wanna talk about the height of this bike, at least the one I received. This is the standard X-Pro, not the M, not the X. X has adjustable suspension, six speed, with a counter bouncer, but a lot of people say that this standard 255 speed puts out a little bit more power. I don't know. It might just be the way they come tuned from the factory. Uh, they do have a little cat in the exhaust, I hear. Maybe I'll remove that. Probably upgrade carbs at some point. But the bike ran fine the way it was. Again, out of the box, the way mine came, I was a little worried it was going to be too tall. I was going to have to slide the forks down a little bit and lower the back end a little. It fits great. Actually, it's, I think, slightly lower seat height than the Storm 150, especially after I added preload to it. So this is only jumping around about 12 miles of trail riding, hopping off of some small jumps and stuff. I am almost flat foot on both sides. I mean, my heel's barely off the ground. With the dirt bike boots on, I would be sitting flat foot. I'm 160 pounds and 5'7". Just want to let people know, like I was worried about getting the X model being an inch and a half taller than this model. I think I could have made the X model fit me very well by backing off the spring a little bit, sliding the forks up a little. These forks are all the way up. This thing fits me great. I'll probably actually end up adding a little bit of preload to the back shock. It's fairly soft right now. But time will tell, we're gonna take this thing on a pretty much bone stock trail ride. Only thing I'm going to change is I'm gonna add some hang guards just in case it's really mucky out here in the Northwest in the winter time. Just don't want to lay it down, break a brake lever or a clutch lever off right off the bat. We're going to put some hand guards on it. Other than that, the bike's going to be bone stock for the ride. I'm definitely happy with the size. No one talks about this. They're standing behind their bikes. They're revving them out in the garage. No one's talking about it. I see some dudes are tiptoed. I don't know if they got a super tall bike or they're really small, but no one talks about the size. I'm fairly short. I would say if you're any taller than me, you might want to consider the X model because it has adjustable suspension. It's like 400 bucks more. But one other thing to consider, the wheelbase on this stock model here, the regular Templar, is actually shorter. And there's a guy, I'll put a link to his channel, I'll put a name down here. He's got the X and he's got the regular Templar and he finds himself riding the regular model more because he just said it feels really good on the trails. Um, I didn't need anything super fancy, just wanted a basic Enduro. So that's why I rolled with this one. Just to let people know though, if you're like 5'10 or taller, you may consider the X model. So here's a little gearing chest. We are gonna do uh, 40 and see where it's at in fifth. Looks like we're on the verge of almost six grand. Let's open up to 50 and see where we're at. Looks like 50 is a solid seven grand. Got my friend Mike out here today. He's on a really big Yamaha Dual Sport and got my nephew on a uh, XR250 out here. We got frost on the sides of the roads. It's cold, it's uh, late December. I'd say the power is completely fine on this bike. I mean, it's not a freakish amount of power, but it feels like any kind of Honda Yamaha 250 air cooled basic bike like this I've ever ridden. It's got plenty of grunt. 
the gearing right now is definitely geared for trail riding, which is kind of a trail bike. Definitely gonna add a little spring preload to the back shock. So I'm not that heavy, but it comes pretty soft. So there's a little hill climb here. I'm gonna get a few shots at. I don't think Mike should be taking his bike up it. Liam doesn't think he's gonna make it on his bike because his tire's pretty, pretty shot, so. So I feel like it's kind of a modern geometry with the frame and the way the bike rides. It's got the low slung gas tank so it holds all the fuel really low. It's got the long flat seat on it so it feels like a modern bike. Pretty decent front and back disc brakes. They work completely well for the light bike. And it feels like it's got a really basic but decent power. Uh, really almost like an XR250 uh, engine in it but a two valve. Runs really well. It's got a lot of low-end grunt, but revs out pretty quickly too. So it feels like it's almost got a lot of low-end grunt like a heavy flywheel, but revs pretty quick like a light flywheel. So whatever they got going, a little bit of magic in the engine, but it's not a powerhouse, not crazy power like modern 250 race bike four strokes, but it just has a really simple air-cooled engine that's gonna be easy to work on and just works pretty well. Oh man, that's great. All in all, bike feels pretty damn good. If you put me on it, didn't see any graphics or anything, I would say besides this brakes being better than mid 80s, 250 air cooled, you know, Yamaha or Honda, any of that stuff. The power is about very similar, even bone stock to a uh, 250 air cooled bike. The bike fits me really well on 5'7", 160 pounds, probably got another 10 pounds of tools and camera gear in the backpack. But all in all, it ripped that mucky trails and the hill climbs up here no problem. You know, time will tell, you know, how these things hold up. I'm gonna adjust a little more preload in that back spring, but all in all, the bike fits me well, and that's fantastic because I have a hard time finding bikes that fit me well, and it's not super heavy, so yeah, bone stock, it rips pretty well. I hear that once you either reach out these cars or put a nibby carb on there, people say it opens up a little more. Feature video, we're gonna do some more mods to it. Dude, for like, I think 1,700 bucks, that was after shipping, I think 1,400 for the bike. It's really not bad. I think if you know how to do maintenance on bikes, shouldn't have a problem with this thing. It's the people that don't know how to maintain stuff and they gripe about because something fell off because they didn't pay attention to a motor mount coming loose or something like that. It is slick. It's either mud and leaves or frost on the ground, but hey, we're riding at the end of December, so can't complain too much about that. I think this is a great little dual sport trail bike. More lean towards trails than riding on the road, but I think with changing the gearing slightly, it's gonna be fine. I mean, this bike feels, if I didn't know it was a Chinese built bike, I would completely think if someone just hopped, really hopped me on this thing without seeing any brands and looking over too close, I would think for sure that uh, like a company was building basically like a a simplified XR250 again. I mean, that's what it kind of feels like to me. I've had one in the past. This thing's a lot like it. And this jump that did not bottom out. It didn't go crazy high on there. It's just a little bit of a roller jump, but no problem. Worth noting, the brakes on here are completely fine. I'm running stock pads. Like I said, I cleaned off the rotors and pads with brake clean before I ran it at all in case there's any shipping grease. 
I have to say the back brake on here is tremendously better than my XR650L, that's a Honda. That back brake on that bike sucks and my friends have had them too. So all three XL or XR650Ls we've had, the back brakes suck. All right, quick race. Uh, well, I don't want to redline it too much because it's breaking in. So let's just go to uh, up there a few hundred yards, okay? Ready? One, two, three, go. taking it easy i didn't try to take it much past 8,000 because she only got 24 miles on the bike right now it redlines at 10 but keep in mind he's got an xr 250 with a 280 kit which is high compression so for a bone stock not even rejetted bike compared to an xr 280 rejetted and uh that's a four valve engine as well and he was revving the hell out of the thing i didn't take it to redline so but not too bad so my nephew's gonna ride it. You've never ridden it before, have you? No, no. No, fresh. So yeah, you gotta turn the key on. Oh yeah, yeah. Gotta pull the front lever to get the electric start to work. There you go. So here's uh, Liam's trail tractor. Got the 280 big bore in it, and uh, I'm sure it's been rejetted. I've had an XR in the past, they're great bikes, but the charging system if you get one of these to make it a dual sport, you still got to get a higher output stator because it's just barely enough to power the headlight. If you hear any clunking and clatter, it's a hard chain guide down here. Okay, I was and the that. chain will go clack, 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 clack. It's, but uh, that's all it is. I got an O-ring chain I'm gonna put on. Take it for another spin. <laughs> <Woo. laughs> okay, so Say if no one told you it was a Chinese bike from Amazon and a various different sites. If someone just said hop on and ride it, where do you think about it? Dude, first impressions when I took off, it was like, it kind of feels pit bikey. Yeah. Mildly a little bit. Yeah. And the geometry <laughs> feels excellent, like a modern bike. Yeah. Um, like I wish I had kind of that more flat, uh, longer style that this has on mine. It's yeah, you can kind of slide around because I forgot how extreme these are. These are like humpback, dude. But I had one of these rip the hell out of it. It's no big thing, but I forgot the styling. And what year is your bike? 2003, I think. So these things you can get for around two to $2,800 locally. Um, you gotta deal with the Craigslist people, you know, like what's going on with this oil leak? Oh, what oil leak? You can get under there and you find that's got JB Weld or something on the damn crankcase or whatever. I mean, this one's not, but I just have had too many situations like that. All in all. I, uh, I'm certainly impressed. <laughs> Well, you know, time will tell on this one. Your bike is, who knows how many miles, it doesn't have an odometer being a trail bike, but I mean, that thing's been going rock solid for years. Who knows about this one, but I think basic bike maintenance, I think this should be able to go for a while, but time will tell. The engine, impressive thing about this is a whole engine shipped to your house for this bike, a full, full engine bolted right in is 550. That includes shipping. So that is kind of a, kind of a nice thing. What do you think the engine costs for one of these? <laughs> More than 550, but uh, I don't think it's too bad. <laughs> Probably more than the whole bike. Oh yeah, I've had an engine for that's five grand, man. <laughs> so Mike took the bike for a ride. It looks tiny on him. We'd have to definitely bump up the uh, preload on the back shock and do something to the front. But your height and weight, Mike? Uh, six foot two twenty. Yeah, it's it a definitely solid beast. feels small and cramped to me but it looks small and cramped so. flat-footed. <laughs> yeah it looks like you're gonna use most of that travel so i think this is definitely geared towards a smaller lighter rider i think in my range i'm 160 had a backpack so about 170 i'm 5'7 i was really pleased to see it fits me well so i'd say probably 5'5 five, five, maybe if you sagged it out to like 5'10 yeah probably no more than 180 yeah i wouldn't think so i mean it you know you could get by maybe but like it's definitely you know you just have to have realistic expectations <laughs> yeah exactly know? what like, you're getting so yeah <laughs> right on thanks for doing uh some bike modeling there mike oh yeah absolutely <laughs> So 
So I'm seeing 254 average on here. That's with hand guards, half a tank of fuel, and some oil in it. Whew, this is terrible. Oh, shit. Damn it. That caught the side panel bad. How am I gonna get out of this one? All right, video's getting kinda long. I wanna wrap up some topics, some things I really like about the bike, some things I don't like about the bike, and some things that we might be able to change and make better. First off, I wanna talk about the um, engine makes fine power bone stock. This thing, keep in mind, is a 250 two-valve engine. I've had plenty of two-valve engines, they're fine. It's red lines at 10,000 RPMs. We're not there yet because we're still breaking the engine in. Runs really good. Uh, probably have jetted a little lean with the EPA stuff. So these carbs, they have a little plug on the air adjustment screw on the side, fuel mixture screw, and you can drill a small hole in there, put a uh, nice wood screw in it and pry it off on the side of the frame. I did it with the carb in the bike. Really simple. I haven't had to get in there, adjust it yet, but it's kind of behind the frame. So it's going to be a little difficult to get to. Um, but also the float bowls held on with like headless screws. So you can't actually get to uh, them without cutting the slot or grinding them off and putting different uh, metric hardware in. I think this carb's gonna be adequate. I know people are putting NIMBY carbs, they're like 68 to $78 in that range. They bolt right in. People say they're great right out of the box just because I think they're mainly tuned. I don't think they're much bigger, like 28 and there are 30. I think we're just gonna tune this carb uh, with some bigger jets in it and it costs us like a few bucks. I think it's fine. Another thing is it has a cat in the stainless exhaust here. Probably gonna remove that. We'll jump into that in the next video. This bike does have from the head all the way back to the muffler stainless steel exhaust system and the welds look fine to me, completely adequate. We'll see if they uh, crack or anything, time will tell on that. Oregon Adventure Rider has some information, I'll put a link to his channel down below in the description, but he had a tip about a $85, $90 spark arrestor that will fit right in the back of any circular exhaust. So we measured this one up and we got one of those spark arrestors coming for legal for most uh, trails. So the exhaust system is top notch. Brakes have zero complaint. I clean the rotors and the pads with brake clean so there's no shipping grease or anything on them. Uh, once you scrub them in and use them for you know 30 to 40 miles uh, they seem to grip really well. Way better than any Japanese drum brake motorcycle I've ever had so I can't complain about the brakes. The bike is fairly light. I'm fairly light so they stop this thing completely fine. There's no complaints there. What other things? Oh, the dash, the nice digital dash. Same as the Storm 150. If you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link down below to the 150 video. It was a smaller version, 180 pound, little trail bike, dual sport that I got and reviewed recently. We'll have some other videos, updates on that as well. So you can find those in the description. Uh, suspension, it's not adjustable on this model. The X it is, but the whole bike overall is longer and taller. About $400 more, has a six speed in the X and a counterbalance, but this engine I'm completely happy with. The suspension I'm completely happy with. Uh, I had a KTM uh, XCW200 that I have and uh, it's always been sprung a little heavy for me. Like the bike feels like you need to be another 20 or 30 pounds heavier for the way that bike is sprung. This thing out of the box, we might let it build some little preload washers for the front after I break in the suspension more and shim the front springs up. We can just, you know, use a spanner to tighten down the back shock and add a little more preload to the back. But the bike fits me excellent. Suspension feels fine, maybe a hair on the soft side for my weight, but uh, I think we can tune that up very simply with no cost error. So I don't can't complain. It's not a pogo stick. It's got really nice rebound and dampening. It's it's pretty good suspension on this thing for my weight. Okay, so with that being said, we're gonna point out a few things you must do when you first get this bike. The tail light on this machine and my uh, 150 both went out in the first ride. The running light stayed working, the brake light's what fails. This one went out in 12 miles of jumping and trail riding. What happens is there's a little yellow and green wire that feeds the positive voltage to the brake light circuit on the tail lights, LED. That solder joint breaks. I emailed the company that I ordered it from and they sent me another one right out, two day uh, mail, I got it. Before I actually got a hold of them, I started working and repairing the one that I had on my other bike. Really simple to solder again, but honestly, don't wait until it breaks. What you're gonna to wanna to do is get some clear silicone caulking, pull out the rubber grommet where everything goes into the taillight housing, squirt that whole area where the wires go into the circuit board full of clear silicone. It's gonna vibration dampen the whole thing. Plus it's gonna seal up the taillight. I also go around where the back edge of the taillight is, where the black meets the red 
taillight lens and put a little clear silicone because the other bike I rode on really wet days and got moisture in the taillight. So I had to dry that out before I did the repair. Do that before you get going. There's another part down here. As soon as I got the bike out of the box, I noticed it's a, um, a crankcase to airbox vent. It's a pretty good size tube, maybe three eighths ID. And that was up against, at least on my bike, it was up against just slightly on the exhaust header here. And if you would have ran it that way, it all would have melted a hole. And then you got your crankcase open to dirt and mud and your airbox. So uh, I just zip tied it over a little bit to another wiring loom to keep it away from the shock and the exhaust so it didn't get melted or rubbed by the shock. That's one thing I highly recommend doing. Another thing is, I think the batteries are kind of, I mean, it's working in here, but the batteries and chains on these bikes are kind of garbage. So plan to get a better battery at some point and for sure a better chain. Check your tension out of the box. This chain was tensioned crazy tight. So you're gonna wanna loosen up a little bit if it's that tight. Go over a few more things that I don't like about the bike that I'm gonna try to make improvements for. All right, so the foot peg on the other side of the bike over here, the kickstand side, springs down just like any bike would. Well, this one has a spring in it, but it's not a spring, you know, that brings it back down in case you bail. See this? This is purposely made from the factory. This is a kind of a, um, a not a thought through thing on the bike. I can make do with it. I am going to make this a spring load peg, get another spring in there because that drives me nuts. Doesn't kick up that often, but we all know, man, since they started putting spring loaded pegs in the 70s, no bike should not have them, you know? So the reason they did this is because the Kickstarter will come down and hit the peg and you won't get much of a kick. So they designed that that way. So if you had to use the Kickstarter, you can push it past there. What I'm gonna do is put a spring in here. I'm gonna keep, I always keep zip ties in my backpack. If I'm in a situation where I cannot roll start this bike and the battery's dead, I'm just gonna put a zip tie up here to zip tie this thing. Give it a few good kicks to get it started. It kick starts easy when the foot pegs up. Rip this bit zip tie off and ride out of there. You know, it's not a situation where I don't think I'm gonna be stranded. I'm gonna buy a super high end battery for the next video. But I think that's just kind of a, not very thought through. I think this chassis was designed where you could fit some different engines in here and that's the way they made that have clearance. But for X Pro's credit, I have to say, they could have just eliminated the Kickstarter altogether because this bike's electric start. So I'm happy they included a Kickstart because I think any Enduro, any trail bike should have this. A lot of Yamahas, Suzukis, and Hondas, since they started going electric start on most of their mid 90s dual sports, and then they just kind of deleted the Kickstarter altogether. That's all right, because electric start usually works, but it's nice to have as a backup. Any dirt bike should have them. So another gripe I have is the petcock valve on this bike is only on and off, like an old uh, two-stroke race bike from the 80s. I don't like that, you know, if it's got turn signals, it can be used on the street. It should have a reserve, so I'm gonna have to keep a little fuel bottle probably with me if I'm going any long distance trips where I think I may be running low, because once you're out, you're out on it. I haven't had an issue yet, but I don't like that. X-Pro, put a reserve on your bikes. I think the X might have that reserve because it's more of a bigger dual sport-ish, but don't quote me on it. The final gripe is the kickstand over here. It sits at a really strange angle when the bike is down. Also when it's up, it sits up kind of higher like a KTM, but it's so close to your heel that when my friend Mike rode it, I could see that he his heel was bumping it and holding the kickstand horizontal. And I feel like the spring's okay. I haven't had it come down on me yet, but I've also had my heel hit it and hold it like horizontal when it should be up higher. So I don't like that. Something about the kickstand angle is just not thought out well. So I'm gonna do some modifications to it. I might end up making a aluminum kickstand for this and put a heavier duty spring, or I'll see if I can find like a KTM kickstand I can adapt to it. So that will all be kind of updated in a future video. The next video I'm gonna put out on this bike, we're gonna be doing a bunch of upgrades to it to lighten the bike to make it more durable, fix and fine tune a few little things on the bike to make it work even better. Kind of address the gearing right now, it's pretty good for trail riding. Like I don't see any issue to change the gearing if you're mainly riding trails. So at seven grand, the bike was going about 50. It red lines at 10. So I think I'm gonna play around with the rear sprocket, change it and see how, if we can compromise between a decent dual sport for back road, paved roads, getting into town, doing stuff like that, and then hitting up the trails, so. All right, well, thanks guys. If you have any questions or anything, leave in the comments below. I'll try to include it in a future video. You know, time will tell on these bikes. I'm pretty sold on it so far, but let's keep your fingers crossed. Hope it holds up well. I think bike maintenance is a very key thing for any type of dirt bike, Japanese built or Chinese built. So if you're not up on your maintenance, the bike's probably gonna fall apart. So we did a bunch of Loctiting on here. I think the bike's gonna hold up well. 
but I'll keep making videos, some updates on this, and we're gonna be ripping this thing in the next video on some nice trails after we've done some updates, but bone stock out of the box. It's pretty rideable on trails, and it's a good little all-around dual sport. Until next time, take care. Bye.